Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to spend some time together virtually. We thank you for your word and the chance we have to study it together now. We pray that you guide our, our thoughts and our conversation and use this time to your glory and for the building up of all of us who are here. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, so last time we really got through the core of what's going on in chapter three, but I think... Um, I was going to spend a little more time on the last part of it. So um, I'm going to start reading in chapter 3, verse 7, and take it to the end of the chapter. And again, we covered most of this last time. Uh, I'll review it briefly, but then we'll, um, uh, we'll go on. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in, in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Okay, so again, here what he's doing is he's quoting from uh, Psalm 95. Um, it's a, probably, I, I didn't check this, it's probably the Septuagint here that he's using. It's a little different from the Hebrew, but the, the basic uh, meaning is pretty much the same. And he's using Psalm 95 as a warning to them. Um, this is the second part of Psalm 95. The first part is a psalm of praise, but then you get this warning not to be like the people in the wilderness. Um, and, you know, the reason is, he says, look, they had an evil, unbelieving heart. They fell away from God. They hardened their heart. When he talks about hardening, what he's referring to is a tendency to repeated, consistent sin that leads you to ignore God um, and ultimately to reject him. Um, so what he's doing is he's taking the psalm and saying, okay, look, the, the psalmist wrote this, and he'll be dealing with this a little more later in chapter 4. The psalmist wrote this about the people in the wilderness, but you'll note the psalmist said today. So this, is, this today is a day that applies every day. So you see he says, um, verse uh, 13, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today. But what day isn't today? You know, it's, every day is today. So this is, this is a constant thing, a constant theme uh, of exhortation to each other and a constant warning to us not to be like them not to be unbelieving, not to be disobedient. Um, you know, he talks about, again, being hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Um, deceitfulness is one of the characteristics of sin as a principle that is at work in, in people's lives. Um, it, so picking up, well, let, let's just pick it up with, um, with verse 13 here. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you should be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The exhort one another here it probably ties into a theme that is going to come up again later. It seems fairly likely that the people he's writing to had given up meeting together as Christians. Maybe they were just going to the synagogue or something like that. Um, and here he's he you know, he's warning them against that. He's saying, "Look, you you need to be getting together. You need to be exhorting each other. You need to be encouraging each other, um, because otherwise, it is way too easy for the deceitfulness of sin to lead to a hardened heart against God. We need each other. We need each other's exhortation. We need each other's encouragement to keep us from." 
well, from failing in this way. Uh, and then there's a very strong word, if. Um, excuse me, just before this verse 14, for we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. The if here is a, you know, there are a couple of different words that can be translated if in Greek. This is a really strong one. This is a very strong conditional statement. We have come to share in Christ. Um, interesting phrase. This is probably related to when Paul talks about us being in Christ. It's probably a similar idea. Um, we have a, a portion of Christ. We have a, a portion, a share in him uh, and in his inheritance. But that is only true if we hold our original confidence firm to the end. In other words, if we lose our confidence, um, and the word confidence here, it's actually an interesting word in Greek. It's, it's frequently something, a, a word that is used to describe um, basically an inheritance, um, something that is willed to you. So um, confidence, I think, works here, but, the, but where he's talking about having a share in Christ and the confidence, the suggestion here, the, or the, the, the imagery here is we are going to inherit with Christ if we maintain, if we maintain our position in that inheritance, if we maintain our confidence in him firm to the end. And this reminds us of Jesus, Jesus saying, um, whoever endures to the end will be saved. You know, this is echoing Jesus's words there. Uh, and then he goes back to Psalm 95, as it says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Um, and then, then there's a series of rhetorical questions, most of which are answered immediately. Uh, who were those who heard and yet rebelled? That's the question. The answer was in the next question. Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? The led by Moses is kind of important here because one of the things that he's trying to show or one of the things that the author is pushing is, is the point that Jesus is superior to Moses. The people led by Moses fell away. The people who are led by Jesus shouldn't. Okay, And with whom was he, God, provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? So you have the question and you have the answer in the next question. And then we have a fifth question, which changes the pattern slightly, but it's basically the same kind of idea. Um, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? Okay, so he's rehearsing the history of what happened in Israel in these five essentially rhetorical questions. He's reminding them that the people who were disobedient, who were unbelieving and all of that, were judged by God. You know, they were led by Moses, and this was, you know, in a sense, demonstrates that Moses wasn't quite the leader one would hope for um, compared to Jesus. But um, the, the key point is they were disobedient to Moses, and they died as a result. Yeah, Heidi. Unmute, yeah. When it says, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, does that mean not all that came out of Egypt by Moses did provoke? Um, well, some we heard did provoke, the, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Yeah, the, 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 the sense is, was it not all? Ah. So mm -hmm. you, you will recall that except for Joshua and Caleb, the entire generation of adults that came out of Egypt died in the wilderness. Yes. Okay. So, so you're saying that it means for some, when they had heard, did provoke. And those that provoked were the ones that came out of Egypt by Moses. Yeah. What does the not all mean? Um. It, it, it's a rhetorical question. It should be translated, was it not all who came oh, out of Egypt? I understand. Thank you so much. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Now, okay, so, so you have that, 
and then he turns his focus to something a little bit different uh, in the last rhetorical question. To whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? The phrase enter his rest is, is going to be key here. Um, but th those who were disobedient, they were the ones that God said would not enter his rest. And then he concludes this section by saying, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Um, now, it's worth noting that in Greek, uh, there is no distinction between faith and faithfulness. So when you talk about unbelief, the, it's the same, the, uh, believe or faith is the same word as faithful. It's, it, th th there's no distinction in Greek. So when you're talking about unbelief, you're talking about people who not just disbelieve God, but who by their actions demonstrate the fact that they are not putting their trust in him. You know, it's it's more than just sort of an intellectual kind of thing that's going on here. Um, it involves what they did because what they did reflects what they believe. Faith and faithfulness are the same thing. Unbelief and unfaithfulness are the same thing. Okay, so that takes us to the end of chapter three. Chapter four switches the focus more or less from this issue of unbelief to the question of entering the rest. Okay, uh, he's going to come back to to the the warning as well, but he wants to spend a little bit of time discussing this issue of entering the rest. Um, so I'll read chapter four. Uh, I think I'll do one to ten. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as it came to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter the rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath they will not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Okay, okay. this is a kind of complicated section, but let me, let me give you some sort of broad outlines first, and then we'll, we'll dive in to look at the details. Um, the first point is that um, the author takes Genesis 2-2, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. He takes that as a paradigm for what entering his rest means. Okay, so we are entering the kind of Sabbath rest that God entered. Now, the Sabbath rest from God, the Jews understood that if God stopped working, everything would disappear. God upholds the entire universe. Uh, God uh, maintains our life and our being and everything else. And if God ever got distracted and forgot about us, everything would disappear. Okay, the Jews understood that. So they understood that God was, in a sense, working. Um, and we, I think we talked about this last week. Uh, God doesn't violate the Sabbath in his work because he doesn't break any of the ways the Jews understood working because he can't. Um, so the sense of God's rest here is a sense of completion. God has completed his work and thus has entered a rest. The, works, the work is done, um, the work of creation in this case. So what he's looking for here isn't a rest of that in the sense of an absence of activity, taking a nap in the afternoon or something like that. What he's looking at is a completion of, well, of our life, our purpose, our uh, everything else, the, the entering of the promised land. 
is the you know that was in, that was to be the completion of the Exodus event. We're talking about entering into uh, the kingdom, okay? Which, by the way, has already begun. Uh, to the author of Hebrews, yeah. May I ask a question? Sure. So, um, when when they talk when he's talking about entering God's rest, is that something that has happened to a believer? right now immediately as we're living in this world or is it something that we look forward to to resting with god when our life is complete it's actually both but the the rest begins now in the sense that we are our, our works before god are completed there is nothing more for us to do it's a one of those already, but not yet. It's one of those already, but not yet. Christ is the one who completed the work for us. So the work is completed. Right. Okay. So anyway, so so that's the first thing we need to understand, what he means by the rest here. Uh, a second point that he makes is that centuries after the events described in the Psalm, centuries after the Exodus, David ends up writing a psalm in which he says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So this was obviously not addressed to the people of the Exodus. It was addressed at a time several centuries later. And since, well, in verse 7, it says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, what David said is what the Holy Spirit said through David, um, that word of God about today, do not harden your hearts, is, is one that lasts throughout time. It is a continued, continuing warning because God's word is eternal. It is a continuing warning to us each day to make sure that we don't harden our hearts. Because the alternative is we don't enter, the, enter his rest. Okay, so those are two parts of the framework of what he's doing here. Um, let's, uh, we'll sink in and take a, a little bit closer look, but first, before we go there, are there questions about that? <clears throat> yeah, Sharon. Okay. Um, I think this would apply here, maybe not, but if your heart, if someone's heart is hardened, can it be unhardened? Well, that's something he'll be talking about later, but um, the, the basic idea here is if you're an unbeliever, your heart is hardened, and God, will, yeah. can, God can change that. The question mm -hmm. is, what happens to a believer whose heart is hardened if they go in that direction? And Hebrews has some pretty stark warnings about that, but we'll need to take a look at, this, um, at that later on, and we'll deal with it when the author gets to that point. Um, because it, it does raise some rather thorny questions. Okay. So, quick question. I sure. just said, so to the extent that we've already started to enter the rest, if our heart hardens, then we lose the rest? Well, that's sort of what he's implying. He's writing to a whole bunch of people who are believers, and he's warning them against this. And again, yeah. what, what he's looking at here, and it's actually the, the Greek word that gives us the English word, what he's looking at is apostasy. That is to say, turning away from the faith. That's what he's really looking at here. Um, in this case, it's most likely reverting to Judaism and deciding that being a Christian is too hard. I will get along much better in the world if I just become a Jew and, and do all of the things that Jews do and forget, you know, just, you know, okay, you know, maybe I'll Maybe I'll keep sort of one finger in Christianity, but really I'll just be practicing Judaism to get myself out of the pressures that are being put on the church right now. Yeah, that's I think that that's sort of the kind of situation I think that's envisioned here. Uh, he's warning them against reverting to, well, primarily Jewish practice that contradicts uh, what what Christ has done. So what we're really looking at here with hardening of hearts, contextually, what we're really looking at is apostasy. Okay, so um, now again, the fact that David wrote this 
and talked about, you know, in David's day, he talked about warning people not to harden their hearts or they won't enter his rest. And since this is an eternal word from the Holy Spirit to all people to that applies every day to each person, we have, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Um, the promise still stands because he's warning some people, he's, he's warning people, don't do this or you won't enter my rest. Presumably, if you stay faithful, um, if you stay faithful, you will enter the rest. So that's the promise he's referring to here. Uh, Barb, in answer to your question, um, the rest being referred to here, again, goes back to Genesis 2, 2, where God rested from his works. It doesn't mean that God didn't continue to be active. He did. He upholds the universe. He keeps everything together. He moves the galaxies and everything else. But what it meant is his work of creation was completed, and the rest is in the context of the completion of the work. And since one of his key points throughout the book is Christ has completed his work, God's rest is now already present for us who are uh, sharing in Christ, who are united with Christ. Okay, so that's what rest means here in this context. Okay, I, I understand that. But what does that actually look like if I am resting in Christ today? Um, well, what it looks That's like probably what, more what I'm getting at. I understand yeah. the okay. creation piece. Sure. What what it what it looks like is that you are not trying to do anything to earn your way to God by your good works, by performing sacrifices, by going to the temple. Um, you know, you are not relying on your uh, religious activities uh, coming from your uh, pre faith life uh, as a means. Uh, to ingratiate you with God. Okay. You are relying you. on the fact that Christ has finished his work, and that is what you're standing on. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the promise of entering the rest stands because of the warning that if you fall away, you won't enter it. Okay, so that, that's the logic here. So, he actually tells us that we, we should fear. We should really be worried um, about, uh, well, the translation here is really kind of awkward. Um, the, the Greek is difficult. Um, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Uh, this is translated some different ways. Uh, the word seem there uh, is a literal translation of the Greek word. But the the sense of it is more that um, is more that by hardening your hearts, you will put yourself in a position where you won't reach it. Okay. Um, then he says, for the good news, the evang the the gospel, the good news, the evangelium, uh, the good news came to us just as to them. So notice he's saying that the gospel actually came to the people during the Exodus. The good news had come to them. Uh, now, it's not the same form that the good news has today, but it, again, it was God's promise of deliverance, God's promise of rest, God's promise of blessing. All of those had already come to them. So the good news came to us just as it came to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Again, really awkward. Um, but the sense of it, um, it seems to be that uh, it didn't benefit them because they didn't respond in faith. They did not listen to, uh, to Moses' words the way that they should have. And so they were not united to them in that sense. They didn't unite with those who were being obedient. They disobeyed. Um, but he continues, we who have believed enter that rest. Okay, so by faith, we, you know, we'll notice uh, we enter the rest. It is something that is occurring now. It's a present tense, not a future. Um, and then he quote, he's back to the psalm again. Um, 
as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Then we get into the discussion of what that means, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. I've already gone through that part of it. And again, in this passage, he goes back, he's hammering it again. They shall not enter my rest. Okay, so all of this really comes down to being a heavy-duty warning here. Yeah, Heidi. To me, it seems like the words faith and faithfulness are almost kind of the opposites. And so I don't know which one to go with because faithfulness makes it sound like you're doing the thing that you ought to be doing. And faith, especially if you say faith alone, makes it sound like it's something that you're believing and not something you have to do, which seems especially important if we're talking about whether or not, Yeah. I mean, what okay. entering his rest means. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's talk about the relationship of faith and faithfulness. Like I said, it's the same word in Greek. Okay. And the idea here is that if you truly have faith, if you truly believe, if you are truly trusting in Christ, you're going to do what he tells you to do. Because you believe that he knows what's for your best. He, you believe that um, that his instructions for how to live right are correct. If you are relying on him in gratitude, if you truly trust in him in gratitude, you are going to follow him and do what, what he says. In a very real sense, every sin is an act of faithlessness because what it is saying is I don't trust you, I don't believe you, I don't believe that what you're telling me about how to live is how I should live. I believe I would be better off committing the sin right now rather than doing what you tell me to do. Mm -hmm. Every sin is an act of faithlessness. So faithfulness and faith run together. Mm -hmm. well, go ahead. Okay. I, I was just going to say, it seemed kind of odd to me um, that you were you were saying that on the sabbath you don't have to like go to the temple and uh offer sacrifice and stuff like that it's kind of funny that on the seventh day we go to church and we like that's what we do on sunday like in comparison and for yeah. them it sounds more like they were doing it on every other day except on the sabbath or whatever day you know what i mean yeah okay so so let let's explain that a little bit the point here isn't that they shouldn't be gathering for worship. The point here is that they shouldn't be reverting to Jewish customs and practices that have been fulfilled in Christ. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't leave the Christian assembly to just simply go back and uh, practice Judaism. Mm -hmm. That's what the warning is. It's not mm -hmm. saying that the, we shouldn't meet for worship. Uh, he's going to be very explicit about that later. Um, but what he's looking at is returning to practices that have now been rendered obsolete with the coming of Christ. Once they've united themselves with Christ, to abandon the church and to go back to where they were is hardening your heart and puts you in a situation where you won't enter his rest. Uh -huh. Did they, did early Christians go to this synagogue on Sabbath as they had before and also go to the Christian meetings? Or okay. how was that? The, the Christians from a Jewish background did continue to worship uh, in the synagogues, at least while they were allowed to, uh, on Saturdays. The trick is, all right, this gets kind of complicated. <clears throat> the trick is that the Jewish world, the day began at sunset. In the Roman world, the day began at dawn. So, in the Jewish world, you would meet on the Sabbath, which would be Friday night to Saturday day. And then you will notice, uh, for example, uh, at uh, I believe it was at Ephesus, Paul is talking to them. They're meeting on the first day of the week. But it's at night. Why is it at night? Well, in the Jewish world, the first day of the week begins at sunset on Saturday, and then moves into Sunday. So they're meeting on the first day of the week, but it's Saturday evening. Okay. 
but not all the way through the night because they would be so tired. Well, in in this case, Paul talked so long that a guy fell out a window. He <laughs> fell asleep and fell out a window. So, um, yeah, I've I've occasionally been at services where. Well, never mind. I'm not going to go there. Um, I, I'm, I'm afraid I've occasionally been the person who did that. But um, in any event, so what happens is the Jewish Christians continue worshiping on the Sabbath in the synagogue, but then they meet on the first day of the week with Christians. And for the Gentile Christians, they don't do the synagogue on Saturday they just do the Sunday, um, the Sunday worship. This is the reason for this is twofold. First of all, uh, it's a commemoration of the resurrection, which occurred specifically on the first day of the week. Secondly, though, the first day of the week, it's the way they viewed it is that the first day of the week was really the eighth day. And the eighth day is the day of new creation. God began his creation on the first day. He rested after six days, rested on the seventh. The eighth day is the day of new creation. So when mm -hmm. Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week, it was the mark of the beginning of the new creation. Mm -hmm. And as we are in Christ, we are participating in and included in that new creation. Remember, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So we have entered into the new creation by virtue of our union with Christ. And thus the Christians said the day that, that we should be celebrating is the day of the resurrection, which is the eighth day, the day of the new creation. Now, you'll notice I just said that the Jewish Christians continued to worship in the synagogue for as long as that was necessary. As long, Well, excuse me, not as long as it was necessary, as long as that was possible, as long as they were permitted to. By the late first century, the Jews are modifying the basic set of prayers, which are now known as the Amida or the 18 benedictions, and they're adding a, a curse upon Christians. <clears throat> and thus, if you are, in fact, participating in those worship services, you are, as a Christian, you are actually participating in a set of prayers that basically calls for your condemnation. Now, whether that was actually in place by the time Hebrews was written, we don't know because we don't know when Hebrews was written. But what is clear is that the people that he's writing to are in danger of walking away from Christianity and walking back entirely to what they used to have. Mm -hmm. And that's the danger. How could they have taken two days of the week off? for so many years. Well, the, the Jews would take the Sabbath off, but the, the you'll notice, uh, the, why, did the, why did the Christians in Ephesus, who were not all Jews, meet in, in the evening on the first day of the week, in other words, Saturday night? The reason is they were workers. Mm -hmm. And when they got off work, when, when they, they finished their day's work, they would have dinner and then they would go to the church or they would go to the church and have dinner there. So it's not that they're taking a complete day off here. Um, the Jews do that, like I said, on the Sabbath. The Christians, there's no indication that the early Christians did the same thing. That they took off the whole day. That that they would take off the take off Sunday, take off the first day of the week. Oh, and no then, by the way, as as the church becomes more Gentile, it stops being it stops being services starting on Saturday night and starts being Sunday morning as you know the adopting the Roman uh, calendar, uh, the Roman clock, I guess. Uh huh. Uh huh. Hmm. Okay. So so and when when Christianity first started, when the apostles first Pentecost happens, and the the gospel is spreading, and the the Jewish believers, because that's what the first ones were, were Jewish mostly. Mm -hmm. um, they they kept doing what they what 
they had been doing for centuries. You'll, uh, you'll notice. Understanding that Jesus had risen from the dead and he was the Messiah, but they were working all that out. And the Jewish people just saw them probably as just this kind of wacky subgroup. Initially. Of initially. Yeah. And then as time went on and they became more thick, more figured out what everything that they believed, then they went from just being a wacky subgroup well, to being to being it's, not. It's, a... it's more than that. It's as the Gentiles are coming in uh -huh. and as Gentiles are coming in and not being circumcised, you can uh -huh. no longer claim to be Jewish. Uh huh. Not, not, no longer claim to be a, a part a of, sect Jewish... of Judaism. Right. Right. OK. OK. Uh, I have a question. Wasn't there also an issue with um, Jews being permitted by the Romans to worship together uh, because they were Jews, right? They were they were mm -hmm. permitted, uh, um, I don't know the right terminology is, but they were permitted to gather and worship. Yeah, they, and they, they, they were a legal religion. A legal religion, thank you. And then they were also um, permitted to be exempt from certain other um, observances that would have required them to bow down to other gods, right? right. Yeah. So then, so then we have the entrance of the Christians, and for a while, as you just talked about, they're kind of flying under the radar of the Jews, right? So they're permitted this this um, separation as well. But at some point, the Jews started um, um, casting them out, as you just said, and calling them out and saying, "No, this is a separate religion altogether." And then the Romans had something to say about that as right. well, right? Yeah. The, the, the problem that emerges is that Christianity is not seen as a licit or a legal religion in the empire. It's not Judaism. They don't have the special exemptions that Jews have because they're not ethnically Jewish. You know, more and more Gentiles are coming in and so on, okay. and the Jews themselves are rejecting them. Okay. So by the 50s, actually, there's... In the book of Acts, it talks about how... Um, Priscilla and Aquila had to leave Rome because the Jews were kicked out. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have a certain amount of information about why the Jews were kicked out. It was because there was a controversy among the Jews that got pretty close to violent uh, over one Crestos, it's recorded. So in all likelihood, what is happening is that the Jews who have become Christians and the Jews who did not get into such a such an argument, such a row that it causes a public disturbance, and Claudius just kicks them all out. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're already seeing disturbances within the, the Jewish world caused by Christianity that early, and by the fifties. Well, by the 60s, you've got Nero coming in and, um, you know, they're already an unpopular minority religion. They're not, since they're not really Jews, they're not really legal. And so Nero is going to be the one who's going, he's going to be the one to begin the uh, the persecutions, the systematic persecutions by the Romans. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. So. Okay, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the way Bible studies I teach uh, traditionally have gone, tangents are not a bug, they're a feature. Okay, <laughs> so, um, okay, so, uh, well, let's go on. We'll pick it up with verse six here. Um, again, you know, he's he's focusing on the issue here. He's, he's warning them not to enter, excuse me, not to harden their hearts so that they will not enter his rest. He's been talking a lot about that. Now he's, his focus really in this chapter is on how do you enter God's rest? So since there remains for some, there, there is for since, yeah, try again. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, enter God's rest. And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Earlier he said unbelief, now he says disobedience. You see the connection between the two. Mm -hmm. Again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterwards, you know, we're in a period centuries later, and the words already quoted today, if you hear his heart, do not harden. You, you hear, hear his voice, voice, do not harden your hearts. Okay. 
so this is just it, it's a, there's not much more to say about this this is the same thing he's been he's been saying over and over again he's telling them look there is a sabbath rest for you uh actually he's going to use the phrase sabbath rest for the first time a little bit later there is a rest for you but you have to make sure that you enter it if you harden your hearts if by if you're disobedient if you're in, if you don't believe if you're in a, a state of unbelief you're not going to enter it but there is a rest for those who are faithful. Um, and then, you know, he's been talking about how Jesus is superior to the angels, then he's superior to Moses. Now he's taking on Joshua. <laughs> okay. Jesus is superior to Joshua too. The other Joshua. Yeah. yeah. Jo <laughs> in Hebrew, Joshua is Yeshua, which is Jesus' name in Hebrew. So Joshua is a type of Christ. Um, but here the point is that Jesus as the antitype is superior to the type. Okay. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So when Joshua led them into the promised land, he did not lead them into the rest that God had promised. If he had, then David, centuries later, wouldn't be talking about the possibility of entering God's rest. It's obvious they didn't get into it with Joshua. So then there remains, this is the first time he'll use the phrase, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. And again here, the key point is that we enter God's rest by ceasing to try to enter it by our own works, but rather by relying on the works that Jesus has already accomplished for us, the finished and completed work of Christ, which is a major theme throughout this epistle. We'll be, we've already seen it already in the first verses where he talks about Jesus sitting down. When he, when, he, when he had made sacrifice, he sat down at the right hand of God, indicating that his work was complete. We're going to be seeing a lot more of that in later chapters. Yeah, Heidi. Does, do you consider it or an accident that in the King James it says, for if Jesus had given them rest? I mean, those translators must have known what they were doing. That can't have been completely accidental. Why would they put that and not Joshua? Well, the reason is because the Greek is Jesus. Um, but it is referring to Joshua from the Old Testament. They must have known that. Uh, they, they must have known that, but they were trying to stick to the Greek as closely as possible. And since it's the same name as Jesus's name, my guess is they just decided to, to use Jesus. They expect Jesus that there. people will know that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Know or at least hope they know it. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, it's the, the the King James translators tried to say stay very close to the original Greek, and since the Greek was Jesus, that was what they used. So, okay. So, now interestingly enough, we talked about completed rest. You know that that rest is, the rest is based on the completed work of Christ. Now we got something a little bit different. This is. Um, this is part of the regular pattern that we see in Hebrews, where there's this teaching about Jesus being better than what's out there, and then it's immediately followed by an exhortation, a warning. And this is this is where this comes up. Now, in a sense, this whole passage has been a warning, but he's he's driving the point home in these last few verses here um, in this section. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, I got 15 minutes and I'm not sure I can finish this, but let's see what, how far we can get. Um, okay, so the point is we need to strive to enter the rest. And the way we do that is by resisting the temptation to fall into disobedience, by not allowing our hearts to be hardened, by not falling into apostasy. 
And this requires, this does in fact require effort. You ever notice how bad habits maintain themselves, but good habits require constant work? Yeah. So um, this is the same sort of thing. We need to be striving. We need to be putting in constant effort to maintain our faithfulness and not to let spiritual entropy drag us down into hardness of heart and disobedience. And then he continues with a sentence that is one of the regularly quoted passages about Scripture, although there may be some questions about that too. The Word of God, now why, why is it that we have to strive um, to enter the rest? For, because the Word of God is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing through the division of soul and, sp and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Okay. The first question we've got to ask here is, what is the Word of God? This is commonly used to refer to Scripture, which in context would make a certain amount of sense because he's already just talked about a passage in the Psalms, which he has said was given by the Holy Spirit. It starts off in verse 7 again, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says. So the sense is that what Scripture says, the Holy Spirit says, or God says. However, the other side of this is that in John, John refers to Jesus as the word, the logos, which is the same word that we have here in Greek. Now, Hebrews doesn't exactly do that, except right in chapter 1, it begins, God has spoken in uh, diverse ways through the prophets, but in these lat latter times has spoken to us by his Son. So, mm -hmm. The Son is, is God speaking to us. He is the Word of God, even here, although they don't use that phrase the way uh, John does. John makes it very explicit that Jesus is God's Word. In Hebrews, when you take those first few verses, uh, the Word of God may very well be Jesus, or it may be Scripture. The, the text itself is somewhat ambiguous, however, since the Holy Spirit is the one who speaks Scripture, the Scripture is the Word of God as Jesus is. So it, it, the, the exact, you know, how, how you reach a conclusion on this, I'm not sure. Um, I suspect that the author has in mind both, but primarily Jesus. And the reason for that is the way he describes the Word of God. It's living and it's active. Um, living is a characteristic that is typically, you know, well, it's typically used of God. God is described in the Old Testament and in places in Hebrews as the living God. So living is a word that is frequently used of God. It is... To the best of my knowledge, I don't think it's ever used about the Bible, except maybe here. Now, it's possible to be living, um, you know, growing and all of that kind of thing. It's possible to be living without being active. You could be asleep uh, or something like that. So he adds the next part. It's not only living, it's active. This is the characteristic of the Word of God. It is constantly active. It is constant. It, it's alive um, and so on. And then he switches the metaphor. Um, he talks about the word being sharper than a two-edged sword. Um, now, again, those of us who are familiar with, let's say, the book of Revelation, you will recall that the um, when Christ returns, he's described as having a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Um, the, God's word is sharper than a two-edged sword. So, you know, this imagery is, again, used elsewhere in Scripture, uh, where God's word, God's spoken word, is seen as a sword. Um, there are people who argue that the two edges refer to two different things. One of them um, is uh, 
one of them points to judgment, the other points to points to uh, protection, you know, so that it is God's word both judges the um, judges the wicked, but also protects the righteous. Okay, so some people see in the two edges a uh, a symbolic meaning. I'm not sure that that's that's really there. Not the two natures of Christ. Uh, not the two natures of Christ. No, uh, I, I haven't seen that one at least. Could I ask? Yeah. A question. Sure, Heidi. Oh, you you said living and active. Yeah. Are you that the word powerful can also mean active. It, or was the or were you saying that quick meant living and active? Well, quick is living. Right, right, right. Yeah. What, so, what, what does what does what does yours say? What does King James say there? Quick and powerful. Um, yeah. Um, quick would be living. Powerful would be their translation of the word that modern translations use as active. Got it. Okay. But but again, the idea is it's dynamic. Uh, the word dynamic actually coming from the Greek word for power. Um, yes. Yeah. Dynamite and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's the root for dynamite. Yeah. So then the key here to the whole thing is piercing to the division of soul and spirit. Um, the distinction between soul and spirit is really difficult to make. Um, in scripture, it's it's really unclear um, uh, where the the line is. Traditionally, your your spirit um, the the word is the same word as breath, uh, where as in God breathed the breath of life into Adam. Um, the spirit is usually seen as being your life as related to God, whereas your soul. Um, the Greek word is psyche, which is the root word of our of of our word psychology. Uh, your soul refers to um, you in the sense that you think of yourself, uh, you, your personality, your likes, your dislikes, your you know all of these kinds of things. Uh, though in Hebrew, the word for soul um, is often translated as life, uh, but it's life primarily life in this world. So when God breathes in Adam the breath of life, he becomes a living soul. Um, so, the, so the soul is generally seen as being connected to this life. But again, since both of these are sort of immaterial things, it's difficult to draw an exact boundary line between them. But what it's saying here um, is, uh, is important. I think we, I have always had a tendency to focus on the word division, like separating soul and spirit. What does that mean? That's not the key word. The key word is piercing. The word of God pierces through soul and spirit. In other words, it penetrates them deeply and it sees inside everything that's there. The word of God exposes what is in both our soul and spirit. It pierces through, straight through, all of these things that make up who we are, so that there is nothing hidden from him, which you see later on in these verses. And then when it goes to joints and marrow, um, it, it, it's referring to not just the non-physical parts of us, the soul and spirit, but also our physical bodies as well. There's nothing about us that the word of God does not know, that does not pierce through and see what, well, basically see what you're made of, um, is, is kind of the sense here. The division, the word division here, I don't think is the key. It's the piercing because it goes straight through these things and it sees everything. Having a father as an anatomy professor, I can't help but think of dissection and how you yeah. separate things to make everything clear. Yeah, yeah, that that that's a good way of describing it too. Yeah, I have a wife next to me who has done her share of dissections as well, though not as much as your father. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, anyway, 
uh, and then you'll notice it goes, you know, it goes from the, the, the soul and the spirit, it goes to the body. It also goes, and this is, and it gets to the point then, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Um, in scripture, your heart is the center of who you are. It is the center of your being. And um, really, your heart, your heart is something that, according to scripture, you actually yourself don't even know. The heart is something that is really known only to God. Um, but nonetheless, it's out of your heart that you live your life. Um, I, I often, when I'm talking about worldview lately, one of the things that I talk about is, um, in a sense, a kind of heart issue. I tell people that your real worldview isn't what you think it is. It's what you do by default. In other words, how do you live when you're not thinking, okay, what is the right thing to do in this situation? What is your basic instinctive reaction? How do you respond? I use that for worldview really to make a point. But what, what that really shows you is what your heart is. Your heart is what you are when you're not trying to be something. It's the center of who you are out of which your entire life flows. And frankly, it's a mystery to us. Scripture is really clear about that, except here the word of God discerns and understands, it searches out and understands all of the thoughts and intentions, not just in our minds, but in our hearts, in our innermost being. Now, what does this have to do? Well, let's let's just finish up for a moment. And no creature is hidden from his sight. Well, we're talking about the word of God here. This is why I think Jesus is pr the primary referent at this point. Um, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So Jesus, we, Jesus, we've already established that Jesus is the one who is going to be judging us at, in the last days. He's the one we're going to have to give an account to. And there is nothing about us that he doesn't know. Even things we don't know about ourselves, he knows. So why is this, is this, this passage here about the word of God? Why it, does it come here? Well, let's go back to verse 11. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fail may fall, excuse me, by the same sort of disobedience. Because the word of God knows everything about you. It knows the thoughts and intentions of your heart. It sees through your soul and your spirit, even your body, everything about you is known to him. So if you are not actually striving to enter his rest, he's going to know it. That's the warning. We, we use this passage generally um, as a defense of the authority of Scripture, and that it may very well be that. But its purpose in the book of Hebrews is a little bit different. Its purpose in the book of Hebrews is to serve as a warning, as a reminder to us of who we're dealing with. And a reminder of the fact that we can't really hide anything from it. So, with that, we need to be very careful not to harden our hearts, not to fall into disobedience, but to continue to exhort one another as long as it is called today and to encourage one another uh, toward faith and obedience. And it that's really like the core part of what, what this is saying here. Don't fall away. Yeah, Heidi. It sounds like work hard to rest. Pardon me? It sounds, it sounds like, like work hard to rest. Work hard. To yeah, rest. yeah. In a sense, in a sense, that's there. But but why is that there? Um, it's there because we, you know, I'm I'm going to use Pauline terminology here. Um, the flesh, which is the part of us that that is weak and that's fallen, the flesh is still strong in us, and that is going to be constantly working to drag us down. 
Again, it takes no effort to maintain a bad habit. But to maintain a good habit, you need to be on constant constant guard to keep it up. Um, because as soon as you start slacking off, the habit ends. Bad habits keep reasserting themselves. So that's the kind of striving that we're talking about. We're recognizing, it's he's recognizing the fact that in and of ourselves, we tend toward, well, the easy road, which is to become a slacker, uh, the easy road to begin um, uh, uh, doubting, uh, whether officially or just by the way we live, um, hardening our hearts, not doing the things that we should be doing. It's easier to sleep in than go to church on Sunday. You know, all of these kinds of things. Remember, he's exhorting us to meet together to, to encourage each other. So what he's saying is, you know, don't fall back into old habits. Don't try to reach God the way you did before you came to Christ. And you're going to have to work to maintain that. It isn't easy. You know, it is a it is a rest in the sense that the work is completed ultimately in Christ. But you got to make sure that you stay you you stay there. This is the warning. Okay. Um any any final questions? Okay, we are slightly late, 8.02, but let's uh, let's close in prayer. Uh, again, we thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the warning here, because the fact of the matter is uh, it really very easily becomes slothful to not work to maintain uh, our relationship with you to fall back into old bad habits, um, to fall back into thinking that we can do this ourselves, all kinds of things. So we pray that you would help us to uh, put forth the effort that we need to on our side, aided by your Holy Spirit, uh, to maintain and to uh, strive uh, to enter your rest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.